Let's start by looking at the following problem concerning the Poisson distribution. Let's assume we're looking at a Poisson process. Okay, so there's some long-term average rate of hits. Just call it lambda. We get lambda hits per unit time. over a long period of time. And so, in last week we looked at a random variable that counted the number of hits in a certain time interval. Let's look at a different random variable. L is the uh, time to the first hit. So it's the waiting time to that first hit using the letter L to stand for lifetime, in the applications, that first hit may be fatal. So there's no second hit in that case. Well, let's calculate the following quantities. The probability that when we run this experiment and use our stopwatch to see how long it takes to get that first hit, the probability that that will be more than, oh, some number, call it t. So we'll, of course, the answer will depend on what t is. Uh, the larger t is, the higher the probability should be. And of course, it depends on the rate lambda. The probability that this random variable is less than or equal to t. So this is giving us the cumulative distribution function for this random variable. Or the probability that the lifetime is in some interval between t1 and t2, where t1 is the smaller of these. Well, we have enough from la last week to do the, this problem. The event uh, saying L is more than T, that's the same as the event, well, let's rephrase it in terms of the number of hits. It's saying that we get zero hits. From time zero up to time t. Right? This is for the first hit to be later than time t. And this we know how to c calculate the probability. Okay, so this event, if we look at it this way, that uh, we get zero hits in time t. Which is just e to the minus capital lambda, where lambda is little lambda times t. That is. The probability that the time is, the waiting time is more than t, is e to the minus lambda t. So for very large lambda, that's going to be small. I may have. What about the probability that L is less than or equal to t? Ah. Well, that's the complement of the previous one, so we know how to do that. 
saying that L is let's see. That's the complement of the previous one. It's not the case that L is greater than T. So it's probability. is simply 1 minus whatever we got before, 1 minus e to the minus lambda t. Well, what about part c? Want the probability that the lifetime, the time to that first hit, is in the interval from t1 to t2. Well, so first of all, it has to be less than or equal to t2. Ah, but then we have to subtract off the chances that it happens before that earlier time, t1. Is the event being less happening no later than time t2? Yeah, that takes in this interval and more. So we have this correction. And from part b, we know what the right hand side is 1 minus e to the lambda t2 minus 1 minus e to the lambda t1. OK, so we expand this out. The 1's cancel for the minus minus here. So let's put the positive thing first, e to the minus lambda t1 minus e to the minus lambda t2. Well, to run this into the ground a bit, uh, let me say this part again. Uh, we can look at it as follows. The event L less than or equal to T2 can be thought of as the union of two smaller events. could be less than or equal to t1, or, so we have the union of these events, or it could be between t1 and t2. And there's no overlap between these two events, because the intervals don't overlap. Well, so the probability. That event is just the sum of these probabilities. An equation which, when we solve it for this last thing, the term we're interested in, gives us this equation. But do we need this extra detail, or can we just do it directly like this? Well, we have a choice here. Well, some observations about this random variable L. What's its range? What could the waiting time possibly be? Well, could be pretty much anything. Um, 3446. Two observations. The range of this random variable. Well, it's pretty much the entire positive real line. Could be much, uh, if the lifetime is zero, that means that first hit just happens instantly when you start the experiment. 
or maybe it happens much later, it is not a discrete random variable. So section 12.4 that we've been looking at does not apply, or at least does not all of it apply. Discrete random variable, the range had to be either a finite set, certainly not a finite set, or it had to be a set that could be list indexed with the positive integers. Well, it's an interesting fact that an interval like this is not such a set. Second observation. In part C, we worked out this probability that the lifetime is between T1 and T2. We got this. That happens to be the same thing as the integral from T1 to T2, lambda e to the minus lambda t. Well, let's check that. First of all, let me remind you that uh, antiderivative e to the ax is, well, it's where a is a constant. It's 1 over a e to the ax, give or take a constant. And back in Math 3b, you knew this cold. And time to know it again. Well, so this integral. t1 to t2, lambda e to the minus lambda t. OK, so we take this antiderivative. We get minus e to the minus lambda t as one antiderivative, either by remembering this formula and applying it where a is minus lambda, Or we write this down, and then we check that it is a correct antiderivative by cal calculating its derivative. The lambda comes down, minuses cancel. And we're evaluating this t1 to t2. So we get minus e to the minus lambda t2 minus minus e to the minus lambda t1. Exactly the probability over at the far right. Well, the, I put this integral I just pulled out of the air, and it may look like simply a coincidence that it gives the, it connects to the probability. Yeah, but it's not really a coincidence. Let's draw the picture uh, that this function that we're integrating here, lambda e to the minus lambda t, let's draw its graph. When t is 0, we get simply lambda. And then as t increases, this is one half of the exponential curve. It gets down closer and closer to zero. The probability that the lifetime is between t1 and t2 turned out to be this integral. Well, so graphically, the probability that the lifetime is between t1 and t2 is this area. And so what we're going to do now in section 12.5 is look at random variables. 
where the probability of getting a value in some interval is going to be given as the integral of some so-called density function. Well, so let me write this down. Okay. Continuous random variables. And this li lifetime random variable is our first example of such a, of a continuous random variable. In general, we we're going to look at uh, random variables with the following two features, call the random variable x for lack of imagination. Uh, the following two features, uh, the range of the random variable, will be some interval in the real line, an entire interval. Uh, for example, uh, we'll have one where perhaps the interval from two to four, or perhaps an infinitely long interval, as we're looking at here, the lifetime can be any non-negative number. Or for the normal distribution, the range will be the entire real line, the interval from minus infinity to plus infinity. In general, some interval. And we're going to look at random variables that have the feature that the probability of being in between two numbers is given by integrating a, so some other function. The probability that the random variable is between A and B will always be the integral from A to B. for some function f of x, which is called the density function. For this random variable. Well, so the lifetime in a Poisson process has this feature. Its range <coughs> is an entire interval. And the probability of being between t1 and t2 is given by integrating this function, its density function. Well, there's perhaps some little quibble that that's a strict inequality, and that isn't. But we'll, we'll explain that away in a minute. Two examples. Well, first, I mean, well, we have one example, so here's two more examples. So example two, because we already have example one, the lifetime in a Poisson process. Here's a simpler. example, where the density function is simply a constant function between 2 and 4. So the experiment in question, the graph is going to look like this, and outside the interval 2 to 4, the density is going to be 0. That is, the experiment in question is going to be, we 
we choose at random a number, not a whole number, I mean just some real number, in the interval from 2 to 4. And the random variable we decide to look at is the number that gets chosen. And the uniform distribution means, yeah, we don't favor the small numbers near 2, or we don't favor the big numbers up near 4. We treat them all equally. So we have this flat distribution function. So the, the equation for the function whose graph we've already drawn Well, it's constant between 2 and 4, and it's 0 outside two and four. And that constant needs to be a half for reasons we'll mention in a minute. And so the probability that the number we choose is from 3 to 3.5 is. Well, let me say this two ways. First, just from the picture. Uh, 3 to 3.5 will be looking at an integral that represents this area. Well, that's a quarter of the interval from 2 to 4, right? From 2 to 4, that's an interval of length 2, and we're looking at an a part of it that's of length a half, that's a quarter of the whole thing. Let's calculate this integral. 3 to 3.5. We integrate the density function. So the density function is simply 1 half between 3 and 3.5. There are places where it's 0, but in 3 to 3.5, it's a half. Okay, so we could give it the full treatment. We could do an antiderivative. Uh, 5 over 2 minus 3 over 2. Well, 7 over 4 minus 6 over 4. Yeah, it's a quarter, but we knew it was going to be a quarter. We can see from the picture that it's a quarter. Okay, so that height was a half. Well, another example. Where the density function is not a constant, Okay, but it's still a simple function, namely we'll make it a straight line. Example. So we're up to three now. So th this random variable is say, the distance in inches from the center of the target to where Robin Hood's arrow actually hit. 
So you see what the experiment is, right? He shoots this arrow. And we look at this random variable. And we're going to assume that the density function for this random variable is the following. Okay, so the equation looks like this. It's one tenth minus x over 200. for x between 0 and 20, and outside 0 to 20, the density function will be 0. So there's no chance of getting a value outside 0 to 20. Now, let me draw a group, the graph of this function so you'll see what's going on. Well, when, f is, when x is 0, this is simply 1 tenth. And then it slopes downward a little. You've got right, the slope is minus 1 over 200. When x is 20, it's 1 tenth minus 1 tenth. So at x equals 20, it's fallen to 0. So the graph is simply the, this, this straight line. But outside the interval 0 to 20, the density is 0. Well, so it's not the uniform distribution of values of x closer to 0 are somewhat more likely than values out near 20. And that's reflected in the fact that density function is bigger, close to zero. Well, so Robin Hood's arrow is more likely to be close to the center of the target than far away. The probability let's look at the probability that his arrow is, hits within five inches of the center probability that x is no more than 5. Well, x can't be negative, so this is the same. It can't be negative both because it w wouldn't make any sense in terms of the experiment, but also because the density function is 0 for negative values. So we integrate the density from 0 to 5. OK, so we, can, we have no trouble coming up with uh, an antiderivative. Uh, x over 10 minus x squared over 400 would do. And we're evaluating this between the limits of integration, 0 and 5. OK, so we have 5 over 10 minus 25 over 400. That's 1 half minus 1 16th, 7 16th. Or, if we like to work with the picture, integrating this from 0 to 5 gives us the area of this trapezoid. And we could just calculate that area geometrically, and we get 7 sixteenths. Well, uh, two properties that the density function will have to have it always has to be non-negative that's true here the density function never goes negative if it went negative then we'd end up with some negative probabilities that can't happen 
So the density function has to have these two properties. non-negative for any x. And if you integrate it over everything, everything, minus infinity to plus infinity, that will always have to be 1, because this is giving the probability that Well, that's the probability of the entire space. I mean, x will have to be something. No matter what the outcome is, the measurement has got to be minus infinity to plus infinity. Well, does that happen here? Yep. Back to example three. Let's take this function and integrate it minus infinity to plus infinity. Well, the density is 0 until we get up between 0 and 20. This equation applies. OK, but before we get to the interval from 0 to 20, the density is simply 0. And after we get beyond the interval 0 to 20, the density is back to 0. So this integral, minus infinity to plus infinity, I mean, it looks like this improper integral, but in fact reduces to just integrating 0 to, to 20. So let's do that. We come up with an antiderivative. We evaluate it between the limits of integration, 0 and 20. We get uh, 20 over 10 minus 20 squared, which is 400. Good. Yeah, if we integrate over the entire real line, we end up with 1. That's why back in example 2, the height of this curve had to be 1 half, because we want the area of this rectangle to be 1. The area of that rectangle, which is the integral of the density from minus infinity to plus infinity, that's got to come out to be 1. So to get a bona fide distribution function here, yeah, we had to use that, that 1 half. Well, two more comments about con continuous random variables of this sort. The probability that the measurement is exactly any one number is vanishingly small. Two observations. For any one number, call it A, the probability that a random variable of this sort returns exactly A is 
Well, we integrate the density function from A to A. We don't get much. The probability is zero. I mean, x will have to be something, but the probability that the measurement for a random variable meeting these conditions is exactly 7 is 0. And for that reason, when we're talking about the probability of being in an interval, we don't have to worry a lot about the endpoints. That is, the probability that, say, x is in some open interval from A to B, or perhaps a half open interval. These will have the same probability. They differ only in that here we're allowing x to be exactly that number A, an event of zero probability. Or the probability that it's in the closed interval. The only difference now is we're allowing, in this event, the outcome where x is exactly the number b, and that's an event of zero probability. So for once, there's something we don't need to worry about. In contrast to almost everything else I talk about, where I say you have to be, look out for this or that, Here's one thing we don't worry about. Well, so this came up in b before when we were looking at the question of whether we were going from T1 to T2 with a strict inequality or non-strict. Doesn't matter. Now, for, such, for a random variable of this sort, we also want to look at, besides the density function, the cumulative distribution function. Well, so let's do that. We know what a cumulative distribution function is. It's a certain probability. So let's write that down. Function, okay, it's, as before, we'll call it capital F, not to be confused with little f, which is the density for x. So it's defined as before, f of x is the probability that the random variable returns a value no more than little x. Well, this we knew from before. OK, what's new is that this probability is given by an integral, the integral up to x of the density function. Starting down, well, we have, there's nothing on the left here. So we're going all the way down to the beginning, from minus infinity up to x. Well, so for these continuous random variables, the cumulative density function is given by this integral. And, uh, well, for example, Going back to example one, suppose we're looking at uh, the lifetime in a Poisson process. But let's put in some numbers. Uh, 
the average rate of hits, say, is two hits per unit time. And we had a density function. Well, e to the minus, or density function, lambda e to the minus lambda t. So 2e to the minus 2t. For non-negative values of t, there was no chance of a negative lifetime. Uh, so, but for the lifetime in a Poisson process, yeah, we had a density function like this. Uh, the probability that the lifetime Well, let's put in some numbers. Before, we were talking about the probability that L is less than or equal to T. Well, what, look at the probability that the lifetime is less than or equal to 0.6 units of time. Well, it's the integral of minus infinity to 0.6 of the density function. And the density is 0 until we get up to time 0. So the density is 0 until the experiment starts. So this integral from minus infinity to, to 0 0.6, yeah, nothing happens until we get up to 0. And then this, then the equation 2e to the minus 2t applies. The 2e to the minus 2t doesn't apply for negative t's. It just starts applying when we get up to time 0. OK, so we now know, for, because we did this at the beginning of the hour, an antiderivative for this function. And we evaluate this between the limits of integration. So e to the minus 1.2 minus minus e to the 0, which is 1. OK, so 1 minus e to the minus 1.2. And since we now have numbers, I mean, before it was just 1 minus e to the lambda t. But now we have some numbers in there. And so we can ask our calculator what that is. Uh, it's about 70%, the two decimal places. Well, some uh, that we had two properties that the density function had to density function has to be non-negative, has to integrate to 1. Let's write down some properties that the cumulative distribution function will always have. Well, I have in mind four such properties. Move the boards around. Yeah, this will always be non-negative 2, but more than that, it'll always between, be between 0 and 1. After all, it's a probability. Cumulative distribution function, call it capital F. It's a probability. It's got to be between 0 and 1. And we could also see that from the integral. Uh, the density is non-negative. 
and if you integrate it over everything, you get 1. And if you integrate it over part of everything, well, the most you can get is part of 1. But if you look at f of x for x very far to the left, like minus a million, or better yet, you take the limit as x goes to minus infinity, that's got to be 0. Uh, in, it's looking at the probability of the impossible event. Um, we can't get a measurement minus infinity or less. And on the other hand, If you look at it at plus infinity, well, plus a million, plus 10 million, we're getting closer and closer to 1. We're looking at the probability of the certain event. When we run the experiment, the measurement is certain to be less than minus, certain to be less than plus infinity. And when we take this limit, we'll get to it eventually. f is non-decreasing, but by that I mean if x1 is smaller than x2, that guarantees that f of x1 well, will be smaller than or equal to f of x2. Might be equal, for example, in the uniform distribution. Um, 3 was less than 3.5. Um, don't use 3 and 5. Yeah, uh, uniform distribution from 2 to 4, yeah, 5 is less than 7. But the probability of getting something less than or equal to 5 was the same as less than or equal to 7. And uh, now for the big one. the derivative of capital F. Well, that's not going to be negative, because this function never goes down. The derivative of the cumulative distribution is exactly the density function. Why? The fundamental theorem of calculus. Well, big guns. Because look at the following equation. We said that f of x, okay, that's this integral. So suppose we differentiate both sides here. We're taking the derivative with respect to the upper limit of integration the derivative of an integral. Now, perhaps it's pedagogically unwise to use the letter x both for the upper limit of integration and for the variable of integration. So before you notice, we'll change the variable of integration to something else so that we don't get mixed up. And the fundamental theorem of calculus says yeah, that's f of x. Okay. Fundamental theorem of calculus. So there's this perhaps unexpected but tight connection between the cumulative distribution function and the density function. Well, got to stop here for today, but uh, some things we haven't looked at yet are the mean and the variance of a random variable like this. So we'll try to do that next time. <laughs>